Welcome to Empower Coaching. Discover how to reinvent yourself, find self-empowerment and live a more positive and fulfilling lifestyle. Empower Coaching combines mental and physical fitness to help you connect the dots to unveil a more confident, energized and empowered version of you. So if you're ready, let's get into today's episode. Okay, welcome to the show, everyone. So this week is Mental Health Awareness Week 2020. And so I'm dedicating a few of my podcast episodes to discuss mental health. So today I am joined by my fiancé, Dan, who uh, has bipolar. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, trying to understand more about bipolar. So I'll start off by uh, welcoming Dan. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for doing this today. No, my pleasure. I've not forced him or paid him. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't have any money to pay me. <laughs> um, okay, so let's get into this. Um, the first thing that I want to really cover, which is probably going to be one of the trickiest, I imagine, is trying to define bipolar. So what's what's the best definition to explain bipolar disorder, which I believe was uh, previously known as manic depression? Yeah, it's a tough one because there's, there's so many different forms of bipolar. Um, people don't know about it. I'm quite well read, obviously, because I've had to deal with the ins and the outs. And, you know, research is a massive part of, trying to better understand you what you're dealing with but what best describes it um i'd say typically people think it's just you're up or you're down and that's it and that's so far from the truth it's um uh, it's a tough one it is okay so how is it defined medically if someone was to sort of do a google search okay uh, medically it'd be under a, a psychotic uh, mood disorder okay so uh, defined by mood swings and irrational behavior or feelings of grandeur um, hallucinations audio or visual um, irrational thinking and loss of inhibitions so there's different types of bipolar it's definitely not just one type Um, which I think might just be thought that there is only just one bipolar, but there's actually Mm. quite a few. So you've got bipolar uh, one disorder, which you have to have had at least one episode of mania that lasts longer than one week. There's bipolar two disorder, where it's common to have symptoms of depression, and you'll have at least one major depression and at least one period of hypomania, so when you're high. There's bipolar one or two disorder with mixed features. So you might experience the the high and the low at the same time. There's bipolar one or two disorder with rapid cycling, where um, you'd have four or more depressive manic, hypomanic episodes in a 12 month period in one year. There's bipolar one or two with seasonal pattern. Uh, which means either your depression mania or hypomania is regularly affected in the same way by seasons. And I th- I'm not sure if I'm going to say this right, but this cyclothemia. It's a weird if I one. I said to, that right. <laughs> uh, people say it differently, like aluminium and aluminum. Right, yeah. okay. Um, and that means that you will have experienced regular episodes of hypomania and depression for at least two years but you won't be diagnosed with bipolar because your symptoms are milder but it can develop into bipolar so that's a lot i mean i'm already confused i'm already lost as what people just tend to think there's like you're bipolar you're up or you're down right like there's just one one thing yeah um but actually it's there's that bipolar is the umbrella term and then there's just a whole thing under that so uh, which one do you fit under so i've been diagnosed um, by three different psychiatrists um as rapid cycling bipolar type two um i mean that's a that's on top of uh 
autism spectrum disorder and borderline personality disorder. There's a couple of other things chucked in there. Right. But they're the most prominent that often have overlap. Okay. So you've got bipolar with rapid cycling. Yeah. Um, so you've had four or more depressive, manic, hypomanic episodes within yeah. the 12 month period. Yeah. I've, I think, I mean, I can't even count on my hands. Um, I have more hypomania episodes than I do full blown manic episodes. It, it can range, like, like you said, you have to have a, it's got to be a four or more, but I've had times where I've been manic and depressive. 20 times in a week or three times in a day when I wasn't on medication it was it was erratic and it was I've in you know, a mixed state as well so I've, I've been depressed but I've had the mindset of someone who is manic which means that that's probably the most dangerous time to dangerous state to be in because you're you've got these really nasty negative thoughts and feelings about yourself and you're more likely to act on them because you've got, you know, you've lost all your inhibitions and stuff. Right, and we'll definitely get into that, <clears throat> um, into like the symptoms and sort of like living with bipolar. I can understand why people get confused, but just going through those different types there, I think was it about f- five, five or six types, yeah. um, each one of them is very different from the next. So let's say you've got two individuals who both have bipolar. One of them may have bipolar type one and one person might have type two rapid cycling, let's say. Both of those are experiencing very different types of bipolar. Very or different ex- experiences, but very, let's say. Yeah, well, everyone will experience it differently, but I know what you're saying. Um, they will just experience it at a different level, I think. Mm-hmm. So rapid cycling will obviously experience it a lot more, but not necessarily as intense. Okay. So would the different types of bipolar almost be like how we would describe being on the spectrum for something else? So for example, what, someone's... Like the autism spectrum disorder. Yeah, that or, or depression, for example. Because everyone can have a, a different level of depression, but still be classed as depressed. Yeah, so like a, a someone with <clears throat> bipolar who's depressed you might compare to someone with autism who's got Asperger's. It's like, it's the very end of the scale. Um, I mean, so let's talk about the causes of bipolar and how a person can come about being diagnosed with bipolar. So I believe there needs to be, or well, there doesn't need to be, but research suggests that there's a combination of things that can make it likely for a person to develop bipolar. And this could be genetic factors. Apparently you're five times more likely to develop bipolar if someone in your immediate family um, has bipolar. A brain chemical imbalance, um, and also environmental factors, including stressful life events, could also um, increase your chances of developing depressive episodes. So, they're the sort of possible causes of bipolar. Do you know how you developed bipolar? Again, it's that nature or nurture thing. It, it's so unclear still within research how bipolar comes about. Because you, as with kind of many kind of symptoms, even physical, uh, like cancer or tumours or stuff like that, you can have it and it it would be laid dormant. It would just be certain things that trigger off, mm-hmm. like um, stress or pregnancy or you know a traumatic uh, experience. PTSD is linked with bico- bipolar. I think there's no history in my family of bipolar, you know, on record, and all, all mental health. Um, the only things that runs in my family is dementia. I think my my bipolar stems from nurture. So environmental factors. Um, when I was younger, I was involved with a lot of drugs, and that would have had a massive impact on my brain developing, um, neurons misfiring and pathways crossing, and mm-hmm. you know, drugs pretty much rewire your brain when you're mm. on them. So when your brain's still in development, 
and you're doing all that kind of narcotics and literally mind altering drugs it's going to have an impact on you later on in life I, I feel that that if that didn't bring it on entirely it definitely played a part in its development so talking about your diagnosis when did you first come to realize or have concerns that you might have bipolar what was it that got you to seek medical advice that was then diagnosed so i didn't have any cause for concern like right because i didn't know what was going on so it's it's not like i developed a rash and i was like shit i should probably get this seen to mine came about so i had a manic episode and obviously I wasn't diagnosed, I knew nothing about bipolar. I didn't even know that I was manic, but I had a manic episode, a full-blown manic episode, on and off for about 10 months. And the reason it kind of got flagged up was because the stuff that I was doing eventually caught up with me, and friends and family started to see what was happening, and I then got, well, I got sectioned for three months. And during that time I was diagnosed, by two separate psychiatrists to have multiple um, mental health conditions, but bipolar being the most prominent. So it was actually your friends and family who noticed something was going on and then that's when they suggested that you go see someone because of, you said, the actions that you'd done. Yeah, in a roundabout way. I mean, my friends and family, I, I pushed them away. I did things that were very much out of character, but... Can you tell us a little bit about these things, these actions that you did? Okay. Um, So I I used to be married and I was, I don't know, I I guess I wasn't happy in in that relationship. But basically, yeah, I had a a manic episode which lasted on and off for 10 months where I I was lying. I was living a double life. I would go to work. Um, I would drive erratically I'd have racing thoughts I would you know risk my life Uh, I was aggressive I was gambling I was stealing I was trying to get into fights with people I I was off my trolley really I was I was doing stuff that wasn't rational Uh, and one of the big things was I was having relationships with other people so hypersexuality is something that isn't discussed very openly uh, with bipolar, or many people probably don't even know about it. It's an increased desire for sexual gratification, and because the state you're in when you're manic, you have no inhibitions and no thoughts about repercussions. And I was I was doing that when I was married. It's not something that, if I was sane of mind, that I would ever co- contemplate doing. It's um. It's hard to explain, but this eventually caught up with me. And one of the people that I was speaking to got in touch with my wife, told her what's happened. And that's kind of when everything kind of come crashing down. And I my, I came out of this this manic episode, come, come tumbling down. And, and that's when everything hit me. And I realized what had happened, like what I'd been doing, not just with the cheating, but with with the driving, with the stealing, the lying, gambling, and that's kind of when things were noticed. What did that moment feel like when that, as you say, that sort of bubble burst? It's kind of indescribable. I mean, A, you're, everything that you've just put yourself and others through has just come to fruition. It's like, this is what's happened. And it's a lot to fucking deal with because... For me, a lot of the stuff that happened, I have no recollection of. So I've had to rely on people telling me what I've done or me having glimmers of stuff that I've done because, well, I was told that a lot of it is is a mental block to protect yourself. It's like a muscle spasm and it's trying to protect protect it. When it's happened to me, the hardest part for me is realising what's happened, what I've done, and that knowing that I had no control over it, that is the hardest thing for me, thinking about what's happened and knowing that I wasn't strong enough to kind of prevent it. I don't know how easy this is to answer, if you can even answer it, but how do you know the difference between 
the manic episode and doing all of this what sounds like quite exciting stuff for someone to be you know taking drugs and having sex with multiple people and gambling and driving fast and spending loads of money that can sound like a very exciting time of life for some people and and possibly a time where someone would seek thrill or they're maybe having a midlife crisis so i mean how do you know the difference between just thrill seeking and a manic episode can you tell the difference uh, well i can tell the difference with myself i mean if you're comparing it to a midlife crisis where someone wants to buy a fucking sports car it there's no comparison because it's not normal typical behavior for me to okay. be doing these things so and you're aware of that you're not aware. at the time okay this is the, the thing it's called insight right at the time, I have no idea that this isn't my normal behavior because I'm so clouded by the excitement, by the high. Like, I, I'm high. Mm-hmm. Like, my brain is fucking working overdrive. It's, it's firing on all cylinders. You know, I'm trying to do a million things at once. I'm having thoughts about running away and buying stuff and I'm selling stuff and I'm stealing and I'm trying to do the most amazing creative things and I've got all these plans and ideas. Uh, so so my brain is so confused and it's like a washing machine <laughs> tumbling around all these different things and then me trying to pick one of them out um, randomly and sporadically. Uh, you, it's impossible. Like. Mm. I know it's not, when, when I've snapped out of it, I know that it's a manic episode because it's not something I, it's not my normal behaviour. It's so far from what I would do, what I'd be willing to do or accept, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, but you don't know that until your bubbles kind of burst. Yeah. I mean, I, th- I think it's really hard for someone with a, let's say, well-regulated brain to comprehend that because someone with a well-regulated brain is the majority of the time got some sense of control over what they're doing even when you know you've had a drink and you're tipsy or Mm. you're, you're beyond tipsy you know and you're doing some of these similar actions that you might do in that moment but there's still there's still some level of control in there an awareness of what you're doing at least at the time but what you're saying is that with bipolar when you're doing these things in this manic episode that there is just not that control and there is not that connection and you don't have that awareness i mean i i don't even have severe symptoms like so Mm -hmm. my friend katie who you know has helped you and i for a lot of stuff i've met yeah um she she really struggles. She's been sectioned now for two years, mm-hmm. um, maybe more, actually. Uh, she has severe symptoms of delusions, visual hallucinations, audio, audible hallucinations. She has the next level on in the scale, like in terms of psychosis. So psychosis is a part of, you know, it's a psychotic illness, bipolar. So maybe people are more likely to understand that like oh well he can be out of control and do all this stuff but it's just an excuse but if you think of it as it's just another symptom the same as having a you know thinking of jesus or something you know that's how people tend to think bipolar people are Mm. you don't have control over it this is the funny thing this is the thing that i i i when i'm stable like i have been for a while I become complacent and I sometimes think, oh, I'm, I don't have bipolar because I'm stable. And then it, then it hit me, something will happen. And when I'm stable, I find it hard to explain to people because I struggle to believe it's real because Mm. I'm not in that state. Yeah. And this is a crazy thing. I've been through it and I've got it, but when I'm not experiencing it, I almost feel like it's not. A real thing right so i can understand why people might not understand it or might think oh he's just just a phase 
what are the typical symptoms of bipolar? Because I mean, there's there's like the four kind of main ones. You've got mania, you've got hypermania, you've got depression, and you've got psychosis. Is let's say the headaches, but what are the symptoms that fall into those categories that you might experience? So when you say symptoms, it for me it can be traits uh, like what what you're going through. Yeah, and let's just clarify as well that people are going to have different experiences yeah. of the symptoms. So it's what symptoms have you experienced under the headings of mania, hypomania, depression and psychosis? Okay, so with depression, it's rock bottom. I get detached, um, so I don't feel like I'm even living. I don't want to live. That's like suicide. Suicidal thoughts are prominent every single day 24 hours a day like i've attempted to take my life a couple of times it, it it's hard to experience saying that out loud for me i'm used to it people might be like what the fuck like you're so, so blase about it but it's kind of become the norm for you yeah so yeah well I'm taking my life hasn't become the norm but I've, the thoughts it, i mean yeah. you're living with those so much yeah um having no motivation no desire no energy it's a physical thing as well your your body goes through a physical change when you go through these mood changes so no energy no well for me it's no sleep I, i struggle with sleep even when i'm depressed a lot of people with bipolar when they're depressed will sleep for days i don't sleep at all um when i'm up or down you know you don't want to go to the gym you don't want to eat you don't want to bath i felt like i was melting <laughs> that's how i described it i just felt like i was being sucked everything was being sucked out of me mm. and i was just melting and that's just depression that's just <laughs> that's just depression what about hypomania hypomania is a it's what i experience more than anything it's a less severe version of full blown mania um, so it's very much like being being high. For someone who's yeah. not been high before, <laughs> who's <laughs> not experienced drugs and and, okay. and the likes. Energy, you're alert. You're super alert. You're hyper <laughs> alert. Um, your your thoughts are racing. You, you for me, it's I, I get fidgety. I can't sit still. I'm jumping up and down my seat. I'm in, if I'm driving, I'm like constantly rocking back in my in my chair. Uh, Emma normally has to put on classical music or something for me it, um, yeah. to stop me. Penguin Penguin Orchestra. Penguin is it? Orchestra yeah. Cafe. Yeah, it's not bad actually. It, yeah, having having all this energy and thoughts and racing ideas, um, but you feel you feel elated. You f- it's euphoric in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, I secretly love it but i also hate it because i can't disperse all of this energy Mm -hmm. so it's it becomes really frustrating because i i it feels great but i want it to stop because i can't do anything about it Mm -hmm. and this is when some of the actions such as driving fast gambling the sort of adrenaline pumping type of activities yeah kind of yeah but the thing is like when you're feeling like that you, you've you've got this adrenaline rush already mm-hmm. um just from the small little things like i for, for me and this sounds fucking weird like the sun the sky i get really obsessed with how the sky looks i think it looks beautiful <laughs> like i'm driving along and i'm looking at the sky I'm like well look at that sunset or look at the clouds and i'm just like this euphoric Maybe what would be interesting is people knowing what the someone looking in. So when I'm like that, what what you see? Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. Um, if I was to explain the symptoms from someone seeing it, very very fast paced, as you said, fidgety, constantly fidgety, whether your foot's tapping or your toes tapping or you scratching your head or something. Um, but yeah, just very high energy, 
fast paced. There's a couple of times when you've spoken about buying things really expensive that I'm just like, we definitely don't need that. <laughs> uh, you know, and you've tried to really justify it. Or I've bought something and taken it. Or you've bought it and you've, you've taken it back it. with your tail between your legs. <laughs> so, yeah, let's, um, let's talk about psychosis and the type of things that you experience with that. Not everyone experiences psychosis with bipolar. Mm. In fact, it's, it's not like extremely common at all. But my psychosis is, it's partially paranoia as well as psychosis. But I've had psychotic episodes. So I'll explain my psychotic episodes. So there's been times, one that stands out vividly is for over the space of two weeks, every night I would wake up but it would be an out-of-body experience. So I would feel, again, euphoric. So it was like ecstasy. My whole body was vibrating and pulsating. I felt like I was levitating um, and I was floating around his room. And this would happen every night for two weeks without fail. So when it happened, I would be a little bit aware of, like, okay, this is weird. And I'd be floating around the room. My vision would be enhanced and this sound, this sound, I know this sounds weird, but this is just how it was. I could see smells and hear colours and everything was vibrant and glowing and I had that warm, fuzzy feeling. It was really weird. And I was floating around the house basically like this. And at one point I thought that I could control my cats. <laughs> so I, I would be moving my hands around and the cats would be following and I would like be almost like an orchestra directing them. And at one point, I shit you not, this actually happened, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I moved my hand and the cat followed it and it jumped in the toilet exactly where I wanted it to go. But then a cat jumps in the toilet. So I was convinced that I had these powers and stuff. Uh, so every night for two weeks, this would this would repeat. Now that's a weird form of psychosis. Mm. Um, but it is classed as a psychotic episode, an out-of-body experience. Of a less... Prominent forms of psychosis that I experience is um, peripheral hallucinations. So I used to get it a lot before I was on this medication. It was it was all the time. Um, I I but Emma had lots of laughs at this when we first got together. I, I would see flies and bugs everywhere, um, shadows, lots of rats. I would see things run up, run around. I still do, not as much. I f- think that. There's cameras everywhere. Again, this is like a paranoia psychosis thing. Um, one that always gets Emma, which I had, an, I had a random one the other day, is uh, snipers. So I think that there's snipers everywhere. And every now and again, I have to move my head really quickly to avoid getting shot. I remember when we first started dating and the snipers were a very common thing. And I think I just struggled so much with the thought of you actually seeing or thinking that you were actually seeing a sniper in the corner of the room or on top of the roof. I just couldn't, uh, to be honest with you, I still can't. I can't. um, It it doesn't really sink in. (laughs) And so without taking the piss, because you know know that I would never take the piss, but I almost have to sort of laugh it off because... I don't really know how else to react sometimes because I just cannot, m- my head cannot accept yeah. that you're actually seeing that. It is a bit embarrassing sometimes. And that that's not even full-blown hallucinations or anything like that. That's not the extreme. So people mm. suffer much worse than this, but it does have a bit of an impact. I mean, yeah, we can laugh about it because sometimes when I see a fly... There's not a fly, but other times there is a fly. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a bit of a joke now. Because yeah. I'm like, can you see that fly? <laughs> it's like, yeah, there's a fly there. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, so obviously with all of these symptoms, um, you you know, you've touched on it a little bit there, that if, we, if you try to go out with friends or social events, that you, sometimes you have to just leave because of these symptoms so you know how how does living with bipolar affect your daily life my life would be a hell of a lot less interesting but (laughs) a lot more easier to deal with 
if I didn't have bipolar, it affects every aspect of my being. And people are like, oh, you're not defined by your mental illness. I am solely defined by my fucking mental illness. Like, it's got its perks, but on a daily basis, it, it's very obviously very mood dependent because one day I, I might be up and in the morning might be singing along to the music. That's when Emma knows I'm I'm happy. He's not a good singer, by the way. <laughs> I'm happy, but she's not. Her ears are not. <laughs> like, I can be elated and happy and ready to go and full of energy. Or one day I can just wake up and I won't talk to Emma or look her in the eye or I just have no motivation or energy. Um, but then that, that can also... I can have both of them in one day. Mm. I can wake up and be fucking on top of the world and then something will happen. And I don't know what it is. I don't often know what it is. Or maybe I do know what it is and it just sends me the other direction. It takes up a lot of energy. I don't think people realise how much energy you consume trying to control stuff like this or Mm. trying to deal with it, like put on a face, pretend to be okay, or even even the opposite, try not to be... so over the top okay we've spoken about how it's clearly affected your relationships um especially in the past do, do you feel like it's affected your social life and your work life and do you feel like it's held you back from being in a place that you would desire to be in yeah um it affects my social life massively i struggle going out you know, anxiety is a big part of it. I, I really struggle with going out and socialising. Going out and drinking, the fear of losing control. It, it's held me back socially massively, especially when I'm down because I just won't go out. You know, work-wise, it's been great, but it's also been a massive obstacle. I'm very open with employers from the get-go about my condition. I mean, I've got, A, I've got nothing to hide, but B, like, they need to know. But, you know, I've lost businesses, my own businesses, and I've been I've been fired from every job. Um, and do you know why you were fired from them? Because I... I I'm not a yes person, right? <laughs> and I think that's down to my illness in a way. But I I have a I guess I have a problem with authority. Or when I'm up, I do stuff I shouldn't. When I'm down, I do I don't do stuff I should. And that's always perceived negatively. And because I come across quite with it, <laughs> yeah, um, people don't assume that I've got anything wrong with me. So they think that it's that's my character. They think that I'm being lazy or bone idle if I'm down and not doing it, or if I'm mm-hmm. having these ideas and get, not doing my job because I'm working on a hundred different things at once and getting distracted. They just think I'm oh well, he's not a good worker. He's not a good employee. Whereas actually. Um, I'm really struggling to deal with my mood or condition at the time and you know ultimately it ends up in in the sack that is why it's so important for employees to have that awareness of mental health and I think it's really great in the past year it's been introduced and rolled out now for more businesses and companies to take their employees through uh, mental health training or at least have one or two advocates who have gone through mental health awareness training and you know I think that's a great move because it is extremely important if someone is struggling with depression or stress then they might get signed off a couple of weeks off work I don't know I don't know how it goes for the same you know for for saying that you you have bipolar disorder and if it would get the same feedback now now you've said that uh, it kind of brings back the main reason i've lost my job is because i was off sick for a prolonged period of time and then i didn't come back in so i was laid off um now i'm pretty sure a couple of these times weren't legal but i was not in the frame of mind to you know comprehend that right the the argument normally is where well, you're not fit for work so that that's a reason to lay lay me off that's got to be absolutely devastating because especially if it's a job that you absolutely love mm. 
you know, th this mood has taken over you that you're not able to control. It's controlling you in that moment. You want to be in work, but you just can't be in work. You have no control of that. And then to lose your job because of that, yeah. it must be pretty devastating. Do you know, the worst thing is you want to be in work. I, I hate not being in work. It's the only thing that really helps me that like, have that stability. And when you want to be in work and you're told that you're getting fired or sacked, that makes it worse. Like you're already in a state of either deep depression or manic, and then you're being told you lost your job. You then have to figure out a way to get money to live and survive. And it just it's a nasty circle that's happened on and off the whole of my life. What's been the biggest support for managing, let's say, your bipolar disorder because as far as we know there is no cure right once you've got it you've got it so what do you think's been the biggest support for managing bipolar on a day-to-day -day basis whether that be reaching out to uh, for medical advice whether that be support from charities family friend support medication alternative medication like what has worked for you and everyone's going to be different on this one. So yeah. What's worked for you? So the one thing that has never worked for me is relying on the NHS. And that's really sad to hear because, you know, we respect the NHS yeah. and everything that they do. But there's probably certain yeah. areas where they've let you they down. They don't have the capacity to deal with, with the issues. That's a problem. I mean, you've been with me. We've been sat in the A&E eight, nine hours or whatever for days at a time. Mm. I've had n nothing but bad experiences of that. But things that have helped is having a set routine, which is obviously quite hard at the moment with the stuff going on. The gym is probably the biggest aid in me being stable. And only recently has it been support from family because that, that was never there. Um, Can we touch on that real, just real quick? And I know that it's a sensitive subject, um, so only if you aren't comfortable with talking about it, but you say that only recently you've had that support from your family. Do you know the reasons why that support wasn't there initially? Some stuff I can't remember, some stuff I can remember, and the support wasn't there when I needed it. But that is also understandable because my actions didn't warrant any support from these people. So I'd done stuff that was quite harmful and detrimental to the relationships. So they couldn't support me. But at the same time, in my head, I'm like, why are these people not support me? Mm, that's quite a difficult situation, isn't it? Yeah. And it's only with hindsight that I'm able to kind of think like that logically. But that's changed now. Yeah. I mean, that. I think that's changed because I've made the effort to make that change. I've put things that happened in the past in the past. And I've actively, and I am continually trying to improve these relationships. And that's helped me massively, I think, lifting those burdens off my shoulder. And obviously yourself, um, massive, if not probably the biggest supporter. <laughs> You're my biggest, <laughs> my biggest supporter. Right here with my pom-poms. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a hard one to, to dive into. Well, I, I mean, that's looking at sort of social support. Mm. But for someone who's just been diagnosed and they're given the option of various things to, to help support them or manage their bipolar. What would I suggest? Well, yeah, I mean, like we say, it's different for everyone. But what's worked best for you to manage? Healthy lifestyle exercise, which is not easy if you're depressed not not at all it, it never used to be medication because i've been on a lot and i've struggled with it and but i had a, a time off where i was like and i thought i was i was doing well and eventually realized after a, a couple of big episodes i should be on medication finally found a medication that worked for me and it is working I, I i still think it's you know had a massive impact on on my condition and support groups Although I don't go to them anymore, I did go to some. And that was really beneficial because 
when I was diagnosed, I had never met anyone with bipolar, never met anyone who understood bipolar or what I had been through or what I was going through. So to sit in a room full of people who are just as fucking crazy as you, but who understand and can relate, that's that's it. People can relate and that's nice. Knowing that you're not the only person that feels like this or I think when yeah. my friend Katie, and I don't speak to her enough anymore, it was m- massively helpful in the fact that we could be like, well, I feel like this, isn't it? And I did this. And they were like, well, I did that as well. And did you do this? And did you do it like this? And did you feel this? Like, yeah, I felt it like that too. I thought that was just me. That was really helpful. Mm. Um, it must be quite uplifting and almost like a breath of fresh air, I suppose, it, to speak to yeah. someone who can relate on that level because it's just not the same, is it? Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, you have a better understanding than most because you have to deal and have had to deal with me and you've spoken and looked things up quite extensively. But it's still not the same, is it? I've done, I've got period pains and me being like, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> and it's just like, I don't really have any idea. That's yeah. kind of like what it is. But then there was also, there was some negatives in that, having that support group because me and Katie got on really well and we have the same bipolar, which is really weird, but we fed off each other as well. So there was times when we would see each other and if she was high, I would be high mm. or we'd phone each other and she'd be down and I'd be down. So you almost acted as each other's triggers. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's really weird because she, she would just be on the phone talking about seeing uh, devils and radiators and smoke and thinking she's got superpowers. And it, it would make me like high. Like, that was a weird, <laughs> weird situation. But it's good. It's more good than bad. Do you think that there is enough support and awareness around bipolar? I don't think there's enough understanding around it for there to be enough support. So there's not enough awareness? There's not enough awareness because there's a lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's not as researched as a lot of other conditions. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's been heavily researched, but so inconclusive compared to other stuff. Yeah. Because it's it varies so much. What are your thoughts on people who throw around the word bipolar? Again, a mis misunderstanding of what it is. People are you know, bipolar is just you either up or you down. That's it. So I must be bipolar because yesterday I was up and today I'm down. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel fucking furious. But also, I'm very aware it's just people are just not educated mm. it's it's like when people used to say oh you're so gay and not really understand like when you're a kid and you go oh you're so gay and not really understand that what gay means mm. you know or that they're using it in a der- derogatory way but yeah it makes me furious because i think all the shit that i've been through or people with bipolar have been through and go through and you're chucking it around because you you're a little bit upset. Like, I don't know. It, it really gets to me. And yeah, I yeah, I can totally get that. If if there's one thing that you would love for our listeners to take away from today, and there's there's probably a lot more than one, but if you could just say one thing that you would hope that people would take away from this episode today, what would that be? The definition of bipolar needs to be elaborated on more. People should have a better understanding of what bipolar actually means. What are the symptoms to look out for? What someone might be going through with, you know, with this condition? So I think just the definition of bipolar, it should be clearer. Somehow, someone out there needs to make the word bipolar and what it means and encompasses to be clearer. But for now, you just would hope that there was more awareness around what bipolar is yeah. and its its meaning to date. So it's not chucked around so loosely. You know, people with this condition need to be taken seriously rather than someone thinking, oh, he's just bipolar. Mm-hmm. He's, he's just bipolar. There's nothing wrong with him. 
Well, this has been quite a raw interview. You know, thank you for opening up and sharing your experience with the listeners. Yeah, I think if we fully went into it, it would be very, very long. <laughs> yes, uh, this could definitely go on further, you know, and, and there's so much to talk about. We've really just only kind of hit the surface on, on a couple of topics here. But yeah, thank you for sharing your experience with, with us. Can people get in touch with you? Or if anyone's got any questions or they're looking for some advice or just looking for someone to talk to, can they reach out? Yeah. So I am brutally honest on all social platforms. I'm quite a big advocate of, you know, just telling it how it is, no bullshit. And I often post about my condition or experiences and I've had people get in touch with me because of these posts and it's, it's always like a massive little mini win for me to know that what I put out there has been read by someone and they have got in touch with me because they want some help or advice or someone to speak to so 100% if anyone has any questions or wants to speak about the condition anything to do with bipolar or mental health then definitely they can get in touch yeah email wise uh, Daniel James Stoner at icloud.com i'm sure it'll be in the link somewhere i will put the links to your social pages on the podcast episode notes so that people can uh, where to get in touch with you there and i will also put some um, really useful websites as well and links for further advice and information around bipolar and i th- yeah i think we'll wrap it up there yeah yeah Thank you again for joining us on today and discussing bipolar. Thanking you.